Hi guys, my name is Lawrence Baker. I'm an Adobe Certified Expert in Photoshop CC and Photoshop Lightroom. Many people new to Lightroom jump straight in and make mistakes and learn by their mistakes. I want to give you a quick overview of what Lightroom's about and the mistakes that you can make and things that you should do along the way and probably explain some things that don't really get explained to you when you first use Lightroom. You find out as you go along. Look, let's get started. Right, Adobe Photoshop Lightroom. What is Lightroom? Lightroom allows you to develop, edit your images with Adobe Camera Raw. Lightroom allows you to add metadata to your images. Metadata means data that describes other data. I'll explain more later. Lightroom allows you to organize your images, for example, move, copy and rename your images. Above all, Lightroom is an import export program which does not alter the pixels in the original images. You can though write metadata into your original images, more of this later. A typical Lightroom workflow well, you must always import into Lightroom to something called the catalog, and that's crucial. There are several ways of doing this, which I will cover later. You can add metadata, for example, keywords, location, rating and title. The list goes on. It's a long list. You can also edit the image in Adobe Camera Raw. This is called developing in the Lightroom world. You can also export the image to most raster bitmap formats like JPEG, PNG, GIF, PSD and TIFF. Notice the words you can. Outside of importing into Lightroom, you are not obliged to develop, add metadata or do anything at all. The catalogue. The catalogue is the fundamental building block in Lightroom. Every image has to be imported into a Lightroom catalog. The catalog holds all the metadata changes and development changes you make to an image. Any changes you make to an image are unique to that catalog. There is one exception to the rule above. You can write data back to the original file, but only for certain formats. This is achieved by saving X MP data back to the original file. This will allow most changes you make to an image to be available outside of Lightroom. Saving XMP into a file is optional and I'll explain more about that later. You are not restricted to just importing raw files either. Most raster formats are supported. By the way, raw is not a file extension but a word to describe the raw data straight out of a camera. It is not an acronym, so it shouldn't be capitalised unless it starts a sentence. Raw is just a generic term for data that comes out of a camera without being turned into JPEG. It's just the raw data. That's what it stands for. Metadata. As I said, it was data about data. Uh, it's quite confusing, that term. Metadata is just a way of describing the different types of data an image can hold. The data types are listed below. EXIF. That's one way of pronouncing it. Most people pronounce it like that. It's not a word. It means exchangeable image file format. It was created by a group of Japanese manufacturers. It stores only camera settings like ISO, time of capture, color space, and even GPS location. There is some editing allowed in Lightroom of EXIF data, notably capture time. IPTC, International Press Telecommunications Council. This allows a very long list of data to be added to an image. This information is subjective and is added by a human. Things like copyright, title and caption are examples of IPTC data. XMP, Extensible Metadata Platform. Created by Adobe, 
The word extensible is a clue to how flexible this format is. It allows for many different types of data to be added to a file, and developers can even add their own data. It can be written directly into many file formats. For those formats it can't write directly into the file, like some proprietary raw files, it writes the data into a separate file called a sidecar file. XMP is a catch-all form of metadata. What metadata belongs where? Keywords belong to XMP. Copyright to IPTC. Capture time to EXIF. GPS to EXIF. Title to IPTC. Star rating to XMP. Description to IPTC. So they're all different types of metadata belonging to different types of uh, metadata. XMP is, a, is really a catch-all thing. It, it can store all your develop settings and stuff that you, you don't even think about. It can't store everything. So it's quite important that you understand about XMP. I'm going to go into it a little bit further later on. And here we are. XMP, a special mention. You have the option to save XMP data to a file in the program preferences. I recommend you do so. You can also save the XMP data in a file on an ad hoc basis by going to Metadata, Save Metadata to File, or using the keyboard shortcut Command or Control S, Mac or PC respectively. If you save the metadata to the file, i.e. you save the XMP data, if you were to lose your catalogue, most of your develop and metadata changes will be preserved, not all, but most, with the original file. Therefore, readable by any program that supports XMP, notably any Adobe product. See it as a form of backup. It's worth the small overhead it adds to a file. Even with XMP embedded into a file, you will still not affect the original file, only the changes you've made to the XMP, which can only be read by XMP-enabled programs like Adobe Lightroom or Adobe Bridge. You then have the choice to reset the image to its original state or keep the changes to the image stored in the XMP portion of the image data. Let me explain that further. If you were to lose your catalogue completely and you've saved the XMP data, when you come to re-import those raw files back into, or not just raw files, they could be JPEGs and they could be other formats, TIFF files as well. When you come to import them back in, Lightroom will read the XMP data and remember all your developed changes and most of your metadata changes. There's a few exceptions, I think GPS is one of them, but most of the stuff that costs you time, like develop changes, will be preserved. Now, you have the choice then to get rid of those changes and reset the file, but this will only happen, I say, if you've got an XMP enabled program and XMP was invented by Adobe and lots of other image editing software recognizes XMP, so it's very useful. And it's an option in the preferences. I personally would always have it ticked to save the XMP to the file. It's inside the catalog settings under Lightroom. Please, please, please try and save your XMP. It will save you a lot of wasted time if you have some disaster happen to you. There's modules in Lightroom. Most of you might know them if you, if you, if you use Lightroom very quickly. There's the library module, the develop module, the map module, the book module, the slideshow module, the print module, and the web module. Most of us will only use the library and develop module and occasionally the map module, the library module. It's about metadata and browsing your images. It has two views, grid and loop. And loop means magnify, by the way. It's a little uh, magnifying glass that jewelers hold to their eye, if you can imagine that. And that's what a loop is, and it's gone over into the image editing world. It, it literally means magnified view. But in the case of this, it's just 
you're viewing the image in isolation, not as part of the grid. But you can zoom in, so it is relevant, the loop word. The grid shows multiple images displayed as a grid at a size decided by you. Loop shows a single image at a zoom level decided by you. The library module allows you to insert metadata into a file. You can do very basic image editing in the library module. And let me show you in Lightroom. Now, if I put the F8, get the right hand keyboard up, you can, if you go to the, let's say the loop view, I'm pressing E now, use quick develop and do some very basic changes to white balance and tone. I've never personally used them, but they're there to be used if you want to. Anyway, the develop module. This is the Adobe Camera Raw interface. When we talk about Adobe Camera Raw, we're talking about the develop module. It enables you to change how the image looks. Any changes you make are stored in the history as states to which you can revert back to, i.e. it's non-destructive. You can go right back to how your camera uh, produced that image, or you can go back to any state in history. You can create a snapshot in history, which is very useful, but for another video. The amount of tools available to you are growing with every upgrade to Lightroom. Most changes to photographs can be done in Lightroom without stepping into Photoshop at all. I would say 98% of my editing is done in Lightroom alone. There's a few times I go into Photoshop and it's for things like highlight and shadows fil uh, filter or tool and a few other ones. But if I'm turning out what I call standard photos, I nearly always stay inside Lightroom. So Lightroom is a bargain. And it's even more of a bargain if you lump it in with Photoshop and pay, I think it's eight pound in the UK, which probably equates to about $11 in the US. It really is a bargain. The develop options for some file formats are different. So what I'm saying is inside the develop module, if you're, you're playing around with a JPEG, you don't have the same amount of flexibility. You're going to, you don't have the same finesse of control. You're not dealing with the raw data. You're dealing with data that's already been through some form of developing, i.e. it's been turned into a JPEG. It's gone through some software developing. So you have more flexibility with raw. And Lightroom really is about raw. Though you can import TIFFs, you can import JPEGs, you can import PNGs, etc, etc. And you can do develop changes on them, but most of the finesse will be available to you when you've got a raw file. I'm going to go very quickly over the rest of the modules, but they're pretty obvious. The map allows you to add images to a Google map. The book allows you to create books and print them via a bureau. Slideshow allows you to create slideshows for your screen, accompanied by music, or export them to a video format. So you could put them onto YouTube, which could be quite useful. Print. It's a very powerful dialog box print. I recommend you have a look at it. I don't often go out to print because I think print is a dying medium. Print is not dead, obviously, but for me, I don't use it that often. But when you go to print, you'll realize how powerful print is. It's got a lot of bells and whistles and it's even more intuitive than using print inside Photoshop. For photographs, it's very, very good. The web, as it sounds, allows you to create web galleries. And so you, let's say uh, you've got 20 images inside your library module. If you went to the web module, you'll have those 20 images there and you can create a web gallery out of them. If you knew where you're going to host them, you can use FTP file transfer protocol to upload them to the server or host and they will be there under www whatever it is for the, the rest of the world to view. Uh, it's a very easy way of getting your work online. So you don't have to know a word of code to create the image galleries online. It's very powerful. Importing. Some notes on importing. 
you cannot wipe images off your SD card or camera attached to a computer by importing them into Lightroom. What do I mean by that? What I mean is you can't format your card, so to speak. You can't take the images off the card completely. They will always stay on the card until you format the card, either in the camera or via the computer. So if you had an SD card in the reader, it's exactly the same as having an SD card in a camera plugged into a USB port or whatever on your, on your computer. It's still an SD card it's reading. And it doesn't have the same power as a hard drive. It, it, you can't move stuff off it. You can only copy stuff from it. So it's worth remembering. You can convert your proprietary RAW files into DNG files on import or at a later date. And inside the preferences inside Lightroom, you can decide how you want them imported. So you'll have to look in your preferences before you start doing that. It defaults to the latest version of Adobe Camera Raw. So most of it will be fine, but take a look at it. Uh, if you're using an earlier version of Photoshop, it doesn't have the same Adobe Camera Raw version as your Lightroom. You might have to drop down a few uh, Adobe Camera Raw versions to get it compatible with your Photoshop. So that is something I would personally do, but you can convert your files to DNG at a later date if your proprietary RAW format is supported by a Lightroom. Most are, there's a few exceptions. I think NEF, November Echo, Foxtrot, I think was a Nikon or Nikon format, it's not supported. DNG, digital negative it stands for, is an Adobe RAW format. It is open source and available to anyone who wants to use it. It would make Adobe's life easier if all the camera manufacturers in the world outputted their RAW files as DNGs. Uh, some cameras already do it. I think Leica's one I know of, personally. There are a few others. DNG works best across the Adobe suite of products because it's, it's Adobe's product, so DNG is going to work best. But you don't have to use it if you don't want to. You can still do raw editing in Lightroom and output it if you want to. I think if you're going to go across into Photoshop or Illustrator or Premiere or anywhere like that, I would advise you to convert it to DNG. Think very hard in the early days of using Lightroom how you want to import. Then stick to that one method. Don't flip-flop between different import methods. Because I've done this and I've changed my file naming protocols, etc. And it's come back to bite me at a later date. So think very hard. When you first start using Lightroom, you're very excited. You stick your card in or your camera in. You do your import without even looking at how you're importing. You see it there in the, the library. You go to develop module, you start playing around. And you usually, if you're not used to using Adobe Camera Raw, you're blown away. And you forget about how you've imported it. Then you go and do another import and another import. And then you say, oh, I can change the settings. You change how you name the files and you put keywords in you don't need and you end up with a mess. So before you do your first import, spend five minutes looking especially at the right hand panel in the import module. What do I mean by that? Quickly, I'm going to show you. It's that right hand panel there. It's your destination and everything under there is very important. Think very hard about what you've got set there. Think about setting up metadata presets. That might be for a later date once you've got used to Lightroom, but at least get the file naming conventions right and don't mess around with it. Decide how you're going to import, especially on file naming, and don't change. Anyway, let's go back. You can import most raster bitmap images and RAW files, with the exception of Nikon's NEF RAW format, which you'd have to convert to DNG on import. You can't import PDFs and you can't import, obviously, vector images. It's about raster and really it's about RAW. But as I say, you can bring your JPEGs into Lightroom, of course, because in the early days, cameras didn't output them RAW, so you only had JPEGs. So, yeah, it's not about RAW. It's about any raster format. But not vector. Good practices. Always keyword your images. Star ratings, titles and things like copyright are fine. But keywords are king. 
In the grid view, sort by date, then you can often select multiple images and keyword them all at once. Because you usually, especially for a landscape photography, you're usually in a set place at a set time. You can't be in two places at once. So sorting by capture time and then selecting a load of images and keywording them all at once is a good way to do things. You can keyword on import, but not all images will fit the same keyword. So it's a bit limited. Unless, of course, you have just done one shoot in one place and there's one keyword that suits everything that's fine on import like importing have a logical way of adding keywords it's worth taking a long time to decide on your keyword strategy there are plenty of tips online now my keywording went from a few keywords to possibly i've got five six hundred now because i do landscape i keyword by country well continent country County in the case of England, that means town and then area. And I can even go down to parish and then even get down to, you know, to topography where, you know, there's a change between a hill in one place and 200 yards is another hill. You, you, there's, there's limits, of course, but you're not going to create that from the straight off. What I would advise you to do is just keyword your images, whatever you like. And then you'll, you'll refine your keywording and build up your keywording list as you go along. If it's crap, delete it from your catalogue and from your disk. You have the option when you press the backspace key on your keyboard to delete it from the disk or just remove it from the catalogue. If it's crap, get rid of it from the catalogue and the disk. Crap is crap. The more you clog up your hard drive with crap, you won't be able to see the wood. So be brave. Get rid of those images if they're rubbish. And what do I mean by that? Actually, if I go to Lightroom now, and I've got an image there I don't like. I'm in a collection at the moment, so it's not relevant. I have to be in the catalogue. You can't delete from a collection. You can't delete an image from a collection because a collection is a virtual folder. It's not a place you can delete stuff from. So if I didn't like that image there, I backspace on it. And it's <laughs> removing it from my Flickr, which is probably not the one I should have picked because I've deleted it from Flickr now, it's asked me do I want to delete it from the disk or just remove it from the catalogue. If I really hated that file, I could delete it from the disk completely and I probably would. I've actually, as it's online in, in Flickr, I, and it's on, via the published module, it's deleted it from my Flickr for, for now, so I'm a little bit annoyed about that. So that, that shows you a mistake you can make. But anyway, I'm going to cancel because I like that image and I want to keep it. Stick to one catalogue unless you have a very good reason not to. Detail metadata is better than multiple catalogues. Some people have catalogues for certain types of images. I would say have very detailed keywording and stick to it and then you won't have to have multiple catalogues. Unless you've got a catalogue you move between people that might be a very good reason where you've got a, another catalogue that you share. That might be a good reason. But even then if you're in one company um, you can have a catalogue on the network, which would be better than having several catalogues. It's just good practice. I don't believe in complicating things. Create metadata presets and apply them during import phase if possible. This will save you having to add copyright ETC at a later date. Right, again, I'm going back into Lightroom. Again, I'm going to go to the import module. And what do I mean by metadata presets? You can set up an import preset that has a metadata preset, but you will see here uh, a metadata called normal copyright, which I've created myself. So uh, my advice to you is set up a metadata preset here, and it's quite easy to do. When you go new, I'll bring up this, this here, and you can create your preset here. There's a lot of information you don't need, but copyright, I can show you one of mine, I've only one, and it's got my, my copyright down there. So it's automatically added during import. I don't bother with years. I just import like that um, because I don't believe copyright will save me from people stealing my images. And if I did, I'm not going to chase them up with lawyers all around the world. So as long as I've got something in there that people could obviously find me from this the information inside this data that is embedded into the image. And I have the choice of embedding this information in when I export it. So yeah, it's quite useful. Yeah, in the catalog settings under metadata, tick automatically write changes into XMP. You should know why by now. I've explained it to you. 
it's a good way of backing up your data. Set up export presets and save them. Exporting is one of the most important parts to Lightroom. It's worth investing some time creating metadata presets. Again, I'm going to show them to you because I think they're very, very useful. Obviously, I wouldn't have mentioned them otherwise. Now, if I want to export this image, I'm not going to show you where I go to. I'm just going to do a keyboard shortcut to get there, which was Command Shift E. Now, I've got some user presets here. Uh, Buffer is one of them, eBay. So if I made changes to this eBay one, for instance, I said, oh, I don't want it in sRGB, I want it in Adobe RGB 1998. I then have to go to and right click on that preset, eBay, and go update with current settings. So it's a really weird way of doing things for most people, but I would recommend that you do it all the time. But I'm going to pick eBay again and I say I've changed it to, I still got sRGB. Now if I change it to uh, say Profoto RGB, I've changed that eBay setting and every time I come back in it will it will go back to that, that, that setting unless I update it here. But it still remember it when I come back in again to export it. So I would recommend once you do any changes and you're happy to save it by going update with current settings, then when you come back into export, always make sure you click on like eBay, for instance. So it's gone back to my original because I didn't update it. So it's worth remembering that. Back up at least once a day. That's in your preferences and I'll show it to you again. I still have to go to Lightroom, catalog settings and general. Back up catalog. I back up every time Lightroom exits. That way I don't lose anything. Sometimes I skip over it if I'm in a rush to shut my computer down, but I never lose more than a day's worth of edits. And you will lose data at some point, I guarantee it. Well, I don't guarantee it, but I, it's, quite, it's quite likely, I can tell you. I back up my catalogue to the cloud, Google Drive or Dropbox. There are other cloud services, I realise that, but most of their services are free to a certain size. So that's where I back my catalogue up to. The catalogue can be quite a chunky size, so you... You need, I can't remember how many gigabyte is, but you need quite a bit of space. But most of the basic free Dropbox and Google Drive packages will allow you to back up quite a bit. I, I actually write my catalog. My catalog is stored in my Dropbox folder, which I have a Dropbox app on my, my Mac. So I only save it locally, but obviously it syncs up to my Dropbox. But my backups are done to Google Drive. And I wipe out my backups every so often because Google Drive has a lot more free storage than Dropbox. So that's why I keep my backups there. But you have to go and delete them occasionally or you will go over your free allowance. And Google will remind you. So what you'll have to do is go back in and delete the older backups. As I say, I even keep my catalog in the cloud. You will thank me for this one day. I'm not being smug here as I've lost my catalogs. And I've gone back to scratch because I got too scared and went back in and thought, oh, I had a backup and I didn't go and find it. So if you do lose your catalogue, don't panic. Just open Lightroom and browse to your backup. At worst, you will have lost one day of edits. So just browse back to that backup and that becomes the default backup. Because in, again, inside the settings... Default catalog. When starting up, use this catalog, the most recently most recent catalog. So if you're using the same catalog, it'll always open up on that one. But you can change it. You can change it to prompt me when starting Lightroom. Now, obviously, if Lightroom can't find that catalog, it's going to ask you where it is. And you just browse to your backup and you'll be fine. Then that will become your most recent catalog. It might have a stupid name with backup written it, but it doesn't really matter. You can rename your catalogs and then go to Lightroom and load it up again. Don't be frightened of catalogs. If you've got backups, you're fine. So what I've done is I don't like the name of the backup. I've gone and loaded that backup in and I've gone and changed the catalog name. Of course, then it can't find it, but it's got a nice name I like. And then with a date in it, etc. And, you know, my name in it, for instance. And then I can go find that catalog and then it become my most recent catalog. I hope I'm not confusing that there. For total security, back up your originals off-site. I use CrashPlan. 
I'm not selling them, but it costs me about £35 a year, which probably works out about $45 in American terms. It's got me out of some tight corners because I have lost all my original raw photographs before. I've got them on a, an external drive and external drives fail. So I back up my external drive to the cloud or to CrashPlan, which is a backup service. It's not the cloud, it's, it's literally a backup service online. CrashPlan happens to be in America, it doesn't matter where it is. My computer is constantly updating or constantly backing up to CrashPlan online. I can have crash plan uh, on a, an external drive. So I've got a backup to external drive outside of the normal operating system backups. So yeah, it's very useful crash plan. I love it because it's cheap and it works and I've used it as a restore facility and it definitely works. I left my computer overnight to restore all my raw files. I thought it would take a couple of days. It did it overnight because most ISPs, internet service providers, don't mind you using a lot of bandwidth at night time. So it worked for me. Anyway, guys, I think I've covered everything there. It's been a longer video than I thought it would be. But these are things that I've noticed whilst I've used Lightroom and I've made mistakes. So I think I've given you some useful information. Thanks very much, guys.